Okay. <clears throat> it might be about 30 seconds to wait. Remember? Okay. All right, then let's. Um, I'm guessing that we're live. There's nothing on the Facebook screen at the moment. If you go to do facebook.com swash weeds duds yeah, swash I've got our dads up. We're starting soon. Okay. And uh, oh, we exist. We exist. Let's give it a go. Hi, everybody, and um, welcome to Lee's Dad's Ask a Dad Coronavirus um, Facebook Live. I'm Errol Murray, okay. and um, I'm from Lee's Dads. We support dads and families to engage with their preschool kids. And tonight we're going to be talking about the coronavirus, what it is and how families can cope in this current situation. Our, our focus tonight is on employment law, uh, money management, <coughs> and uh, explaining the coronavirus situation to your children. Uh, with me tonight is Salim Shafi, the director of Money Buddies, uh, Ben Palmer, the head of, and head of employment law at Oakwood Solicitors, uh, Simon Johnson, one of the heads of service in Leeds Children's Social Work Service, and Ron Batiste, uh, another member of Leeds Dads. Uh, thanks very much for joining us, guys. Thank uh, you. Good evening. And uh, uh, coronavirus, it's, <laughs> it's um, a new flu-like virus that's spreading around the world. Uh, I don't know if there's anywhere that's not being touched at the moment. The virus is causing an illness called COVID-19. It's been declared a pandemic now by the World Health Organization. Um, a pandemic is normally explained or described as a disease that is spreading in multiple countries around the world at the same time. What we do know is that uh, everyone who gets symptoms gets a fever and a lot of these people get a cough. Uh, how do we prevent catching the virus? A lot of it is down to social distancing and um, staying at least two meters from people and washing your hands that's what we've been told by the government so this is the advice that we're following now um with me right now is salim salim shafi i wonder if you can tell me a little bit about yourself and money buddies please okay yeah good evening everybody uh, money buddies is a uh, part of bermsos community projects it is a, a, an independent charity and our aim is to help people out of debt and poverty in the city of leeds and improve financial well-being and financial capability through uh, coaching, mentoring and support and advice. Uh, one of the biggest concerns that's going to affect a lot of people right now is, is being in debt, yeah. not having the money coming through. Yeah. Um, if, if your salary is stopped for whatever reason, what's the answer? What, what should people be doing? OK, well, there's, I think there's a number of things that here. There's, there's work stopping and there's, and there's also the debt situation. What I would say, if you are worried about debts and paying your debts and can't pay your debts uh, at the moment, obviously with salary stopped, the first thing to do, I would recommend you contact us um, and I'll give you our uh, telephone number if that's OK, which is um, uh, uh, our, our emergency coronavirus hotline, which is 07936. 368045. I'll give that out a little bit later on. Right, thank the, you. The, the key thing here is that as, once you um, call a money buddy, you, you, you're, in, you're into, you're, you've got like a shield over you from creditors. Um, the, uh, you, because we are obviously qualified debt advisors as well as an organisation, and then we deal with creditors, obviously at least at the council, there'll be a lot of issues, people having rent arrears, council tax arrears. Uh, there'll be clients who are concerned about the credit cards. We've not heard very much from the credit card industry as yet. Uh, a lot coming from the city council about the kind of help they're going to be doing. But the first thing you'd, you'd, I'd recommend you do is contact um, money buddies. There are other debt advice agencies in Leeds as well. Uh, I want to let you be aware of that, like Step Change uh, as a national agency, uh, Best Leeds Communities and St Vincent's. But really do contact us and citizens advice of course but really do contact us because that that, that will then will give you specific advice on how to deal with the creditor um and what, what can people actually do though because um okay. the first thing that's going to happen is if you feel that your um your your salary your income is stopped you're going to be concerned you're going to be worried okay. and okay. um you're going to be thinking we still need to eat we still need okay. to get okay. by okay so in terms of income then um this the, the one of the things would strongly recommend you do unless you're doing it already is going to claim universal credit um if you want to check 
what benefit entitlements you're able to claim. There's two very good, useful websites um, that you can go to. Um, you don't have to put your name in those details. Um, you can just put your circumstances in. It will tell you what benefits you are entitled to now. Um, and those are uh, www.entitledto.co.uk and turn to us. Uh, .org.uk. These are two very, very important tools that you can use right now and that will tell you what your benefit entitlement is and how to go about making that claim. The second thing as well is if you do register for universal credit, um, they, you know, they, they do say it's taking five weeks to, to get a payment on that once your, uh, once your application is accepted. However, universal credit will offer an advance immediately if your application is accepted. Which could help with which could help with cash flow. Um, Lee City Council have uh, a hardship fund, so I'd strongly recommend you take note of this number. Um, if you just bear with me. Uh, two things: what they will do, they've set up a, a system to help people who've got financial difficulties and can't buy food. So be able to access funds or food. And mm -hmm. this telephone number is just bear with me for a minute. I've just put it down somewhere and just just um it's yeah, always like that. It's, it's just it's when you're looking phone. for it, you'll put it yeah, it's a, yeah, exactly. It's a free phone number as well. It's okay. a free number, O one one three three seven six zero three three zero. Um can you repeat so that please? We, yes, O one one three three seven six zero three three zero and that's uh lee city council's a local welfare support team they'll help with either food uh, financial difficulties or as people self-isolating and can't get food um and they will also potentially help with funds as well uh, for where people having difficulty um i was just on with lee city council yesterday and they basically said they put together in a week what they've taken several months to do so even though we are an independent charity and we don't work for the council and uh, we have a very strong relationship with them um, and which means that we you know tend to get some information ahead of time so normally this scheme is available through um, social worker we've got colleagues on the phone on this on the call today uh, schools or colleges uh, housing officers however you are welcome to call that number as well uh, and self-refer into it and I would strongly urge you that if you are having difficulty is to try that number as soon as you can that's great. Um, um, th yeah. Thanks so much. We'll come back to you in a second. Um, yeah, sure. th obviously, we're um, happy to take your questions and your thoughts. If you have any questions, please um, come to facebook.com forward slash Leeds Dads. And um, we have a, a, a group of um, experts here are ready to take your calls. Um, are ready to take your calls. Sounds like <laughs> one of eight. Oh, I've lost you. Yeah, we're lost. Sorry, I can't hear you. Errol, I can't hear you either. Oh, oh, I can hear now. I can hear now. Oh, lost you again. There. Am I here? Yes. You are now. Uh, who knows what's happening? Gremlin. <laughs> Blame gremlin. the gremlin. Not my elbow on the switch. Blame the gremlin. <laughs> ben Palmer, the you're the head of employment law at Oakwood Solicitors. Um, uh, are employees entitled to sick pay if they're off with coronavirus? Yes, so the normal sick pay provisions apply. So for the first seven days of sickness, um, the employee can self-certify. After that, um, they can either provide a sick note from their GP um, or 111. But there is a, a form you can download from the NHS 111 website, which is effectively a sick note. And that can also be used for um, isolation. So if somebody in your household is sick and you need to self-isolate, and then you can also use that form. And um, if your company um, provides company sick pay, uh, you're entitled to company sick pay if you are indeed ill. However, it's a, it's slightly more complicated um, if you're self isolating. The reason for that is company sick pay is for sickness, not for self isolation. And I'm not aware of any employer uh, putting a provision for um, company sick pay for self-isolation per se although some employers are generous enough and um, to offer that in those circumstances and indeed the AS guide does recommend to employers that full sick pay should be given if they do offer company sick pay but it isn't a legal entitlement this, this sounds a little bit confusing because if um say if my child was sick and i had to take some time off 
wouldn't I get that as sick pay? Whereas <laughs> you're saying that if you're self-isolating because maybe your child or your partner is ill, you can't claim that as sick pay. So in those, if your um, child has coronavirus, um, then you'd be entitled to self-isolate um, and um, use the, the 111 form um, to get statutory sick pay. But you wouldn't necessarily be entitled to company sick pay. That would be up to your employer. Um, although, as I said, the ACAS guidance would recommend company sick pay in those circumstances. If, however, your child was ill for some other reason, then um, you wouldn't necessarily be entitled to um, sick pay. In fact, you'd be unlikely to be entitled to sick pay because it's not there's no requirement to self-isolate. And in those circumstances, you'd probably use um, dependent leave, which is unpaid. Now, if you request um, dependent leave, then that is to make provision for care arrangements rather than to necessarily look after the child uh, yourself. And the other option is parental leave. Um, the difficulty with parental leave, which is also unpaid, is that you'd normally have to give 21 days uh, notice to, to your employer to take that type of leave. Although many employers um, at the moment are waiving that provision and um, given the situation with the schools and childcare facilities. So what if you're um, at work, you um, display symptoms of coronavirus at work, you, you've, you've made your mind up that um, you can get the um, benefits from your employer that will help you uh, continue, you can s support your family or support yourself. What can you actually do? Um, is it okay to just leave? Do you, what should you do when you say, I need to self-isolate to your employer? So if you just simply left work without informing anybody, then that might be considered an authorised absence, which most employers consider an act of gross misconduct. So um, the, what I would suggest that an, an employee does is um, try and self-isolate within their employee's building as, as, as best possible. Most employers will have already designated a place for self-isolation. Um, they should then contact um, their HR manager or line manager using their own mobile phone. So as again, not to spread the contagion. Once they've then um, discussed the matter with, with HR or their line manager, it's likely that most employees would immediately advise the employee to, to leave the, the building and seek further medical advice from 111 or their GP. Um, obviously 111 and GPs are overloaded at the moment, so you can um, look at the NHS website and if you do believe you're displaying symptoms of coronavirus, then of course you can um, self-declare sickness for the first seven days. Right, I see. Um, just like to say um, hello to Tom Cat, Andy, Faye, Rosina, Lindsay, uh, Michael, Alex, Paula, and, and uh, Andrew, who are all um, watching online at the moment, listening to this. And um, if you have questions, then please. Um, sorry, you're going to have to come out now. <laughs> That's my daughter coming in. If you have questions, uh, please go to Facebook Live, facebook.com forward slash Leeds Dads, and um, put your questions in there, and we'll be able to answer them there. Um, sorry, Ben, coming back to you. Um, uh, what can my employer do if there's um, a reduction in work due to a lockdown? What if you actually don't have enough work to, um, uh, as you feel, sustain your, your, your role? Okay. So there's a number of options available to employers. Um, so they can require employees to take annual leave um, as long as they give twice the amount of notice as the leave to be taken. So, for example, if an employer wanted um, a group of employees to take one week's annual leave, they need to give two weeks notice. Um, there, there is the ability to lay off. Um, lay off would entitle an employee for, for up to five days guaranteed pay it's a, a measly £29 uh, per day. And that layoff clause, the ability to do so, is often um, within the contract of employment. If it's not within the contract of employment, then the employee would need to uh, consent to be laid off. Now, fortunately, most employers are not using layoff um, because the government has stepped in and put together a, a very generous package of um, furlough leave. And the vast, vast majority of employers are using furlough leave um, as opposed to layoff, um, which entitles employees to up to 80% of their gross pay, which is capped at £2,500. 
um, and that will be for a period of, of currently three months, although um, the government may extend um, that provision. We'll come, we'll come back to furlough in a minute, but um, just briefly, um, I, I heard a story of um, a colleague of mine who was in an Uber taxi today and um, she coughed and she was told to leave the taxi. Um, is that fair? Is, it, is the driver fair in his position to be able to say, I, I will want you out of my taxi cab? Um, that's not particularly an employment law um, issue, um, but certainly employers, um, if Uber drivers are uh, indeed employer, employees, which is, a, which is a hotly debated question at the moment, they're certainly workers, um, given um, the case law from last year. Um, but whether or not they are workers is a, is a different topic. Um, sorry, employees is a different topic. Mm. But um, certainly um, a, an employer um, would have to ensure that the working environment is safe. So take measures to prevent um, uh, coronavirus spreading, um, such as hand washing, gels, that sort of thing, social distancing. Now, social distancing within the context of um, a car is somewhat problematic. Uh, I, I would say that if somebody coughs uh, it, within a, a journey, that's probably going to be something that's expected because we all cough for non-coronavirus related reasons. So I would suggest that the um, driver perhaps acted a, a little hastily in, in that um, example. Um, Ron, I know that you go to courts as part of your normal role um, yes. in your work. Uh, if you, the court's obviously closed now. Um, yes. But would you go to a public environment? Do you feel that you'd be um, happy in your, uh, as, as an individual saying, um, I'm not going to do this as part of my job? Or would you think I've got to do this? I'm, um, this is part of my work and, um, and step straight forward. Well, um, just to update, on uh, the court system is actually closed all the courts are closed at the moment and i think that um the company that i work for you know employers have a duty to health and safety and given the guidance provided by the government social distancing etc etc all the courts and all the offices um where i work are all closed so um having to put myself at risk you know in terms of um what, what, the question i'm asking is yes. would you go into that environment would you feel confident in going into it well i wouldn't like i wouldn't feel i wouldn't feel confident going into that environment i i wouldn't at all in, in terms of doing my work i mean um it, it would be difficult and i think given what's going on in terms of you know social distancing and 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 you know the spread of this disease that you know i would feel very uh, uncomfortable and not wanting to go into that environment yeah um simon johnson and one of the heads of, so of service in Leeds children's social work group uh, uh, we're talking about social distancing um yeah schools across the uk have been closed to help stop <coughs> the spread of the coronavirus how are children in Leeds getting by while they're off school what are they uh, doing well, many, many schools are still open here in Leeds, and certainly there are hub schools who are um, continuing to meet the needs of a group of children here in this city. So those of uh, key workers, so healthcare staff, social care staff, uh, police and others, as well as uh, some vulnerable, those children that are the most vulnerable, if they can't be cared for at home, the schools are still open. So there is an offer still, but not for obviously the whole population of children here in Leeds. Isn't it yeah. for only for protected children, children who are, are vulnerable <coughs> or the children of uh, key workers? Yeah. Or is it more than that? I think that sums that summarises it pretty much. OK. And uh, for the vast um, majority of children in Leeds, um, all the others who are out of school, how are they getting by? What are they doing? Well, obviously, we're, you know, life is different now and probably will be for some time. Uh, our routines, our regimes, everything we've known is different. Uh, I don't have, I do have children, but they're both adults now. So it's slightly different from, I can imagine the challenges for single parent families with more than one child in a home where there's no garden. 
that you need a lot of resource and energy to be able to continue to uh, remain healthy and, and, and function over time. It's a real challenge. So if you're looking at your example, if you're um, a single parent, um, say two children, and they're all at home, and your um, employer is saying, well, we need you to work from home, how do they get by? What do you think happens in the home? Because well, we're not in a situation where they could say, oh, um, can you go and stay <laughs> with Auntie, no, I think Auntie Jane or yeah. Uncle John? Because uh, we're, we're all self-isolating. Yeah, like the family, the family, the definition of family has been, is being naturally narrowed by, by whoever's in the household at this time. But um, I don't know what the reality is for individuals, but there are still lots of services that are trying to wrap around uh, families, children and families here in Leeds, especially the most vulnerable. So in kind of any geographical area in the city, uh, we are aware of the most needy and vulnerable children across agencies. Uh, there are still staff groups who continue to have responsibilities to work with and support those children and families. Uh, incidentally, from a children's social work point of view, we do, of course, have statutory responsibilities for children about whom there are grave concerns and some of that, those children remain within their families. Uh, so we're, we are not at this time uh, choosing to do pure uh, solely remote working. We are still making visits to families, obviously having due regard for kind of government guidance uh, as well we're, we're... as kind of maintaining safety for staff. Would um, families be within their rights to say, no, we don't really want you to come in. We don't want you to bring uh, a possible threat, a medical threat into our homes. And then you don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Um, most of the work that social work engages in requires a level of partnership, cooperation, engagement together, working with. Um, and I, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised by children or by family members saying, I want to maintain, I want to restrict the number of people that I'm in contact with. I mean, that's, that's the clear message from the government. So it is a, it is a tension, uh, but I guess that's about negotiating in terms of the priority needs for the child in discussion with the family. Okay, uh, sounds like a good way of um, looking at it. Um, thanks very much. As I said earlier, um, it's the Leeds Dads Ask a Dad Coronavirus Facebook Live. Uh, I'm Evel Murray from Leeds Dads. And um, we're looking at the coronavirus and how families coping in the current situation. Focus tonight is on employment law, money management, and explaining the coronavirus uh, situation to our, our children. Uh, Salim, uh, Director of Money Buddies. Uh, we were talking about budgeting before what, what sort of budgeting advice are you actually able to direct them to it's great that you you've got these websites um you mentioned them earlier entitled2.co.uk and yeah. turn to us.co.uk but what what can it actually do how will it help okay th those two websites we've mentioned are a benefit checking website so they will tell you what benefits you're actually entitled to in your current circumstances today and how to go about making that claim, which will usually be through the uh, DWP. So uh, if clients are very worried about what their entitlements are, not sure um, how, you know, how to go about it, these will, these will give clients, uh, your, your clients, uh, your users, a particular, a specific information uh, relating to themselves and as to what benefits they are, could be entitled to, because obviously uh, when you apply, that's when the benefit uh, entitlement is actually checked but these are highly accurate um, tools to use and we'd strongly recommend that clients use those in terms of budgeting uh, there are two two types of budgeting that we do at money buddies uh, one is where clients are being chased up by a creditor a, a, a company um, chasing you up asking for money that could be a bank it could be the council it could be um, a catalog company um, so we will help clients complete what's called a financial statement which is a preparation for, uh, of income expenditure uh, for the creditor. Now, I just want to be very careful here because what I would strongly recommend to any client who's in a debt situation is not to do an income expenditure with the creditor directly. What is that? Uh, an income expenditure, basically, they want to know what's coming in and what's going out. And what many people are not told is that the credit and debt industry got together 
about 10 years or so ago and worked out what is allowable and not allowable on an income expenditure form. And certain creditors will, will how can I put this? They will not necessarily follow the rules, uh, which could mean that people are paying, paying back more than they can actually afford at very difficult times. And we found clients who have actually been foregoing buying food right, to, to, to get the creditor off their back, to stop the calls and the text messages. Uh, people who own money are actually in quite a more powerful position than they think, but we're, we're, we're meant to think that we're not. Uh, and that can create a lot of stress and strain. So what I'd always recommend is if you are um, behind on your debts um, and you need to make a complete a budget or a financial statement for a creditor, is call a debt advice agency and do it with them because that ensures that it's done properly and accurately and should allow for facility to live properly based on the level of income coming in and what you can afford to pay. And that's the first thing. Um, the money buddies themselves will help clients with personal budgeting. Um, so, for example, some clients might say, you know what, I'm really not good with my money. Uh, can you show me some ideas on how I can save my money, make it last longer, go further? Uh, you know, um, can, you look at, can you look at my bank statement? Is there anything on there? You'd be very surprised how many people don't look at their bank statements uh, and find that little, little payments are going out for uh, at subscriptions or what have you that they've forgotten about. It does happen. I, I live by my bank statements. <laughs> You'd be surprised many people don't. <laughs> um, so, ben, do you live by your bank statements? <laughs> <laughs> Ron, do you live by your bank statements? Yeah, yes, I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Simon, go. Simon, Simon, do you live um, by your bank statements? I don't live by them, but I know what's in there kind of every week. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, well, Liam, you're right. You're right. It's a mixed bag. So, so we'll help. We'll help, we'll we'll help clients fight. Look at ways of making the money last longer, go further, and be, becoming more efficient with it. And also starting to get some habits where possible. It's very difficult in today's world in terms of saving money. Um, we've given so many clients on very low uh, zero hour contracts or very low or just on the, the, the I'll call it the minimum wage. I know it's not called that officially because it's it's not good enough that wage. So it's very it's almost impossible for people to save. Um, and we are in an environment now where the work is work is not paying enough um, for people to just just to be able to hold a head above water. So um, there are two types of budgeting. But what I, I, I will repeat myself for, for not apologizing please, please contact a debt advice agency. Money Buddies will help be one of those that can help you uh, if you are worried about being asked to complete an income expenditure, um, what's coming in, what's going out by a company that you owe money to. Do not do it with them. Do it with a debt advice agency uh, because they'll ensure that the proper rules are applied when it comes to how it's assessed. Okay, thanks very much. Um, ben, um I've I've learned this new word and I still don't quite understand what it what it means and I hear it everywhere and um, I'm not even sure if it exists in in British law in English law. Furlough. What what is furloughing? Okay, so um, furlough is is a recent creation by um, and it, it's um, basically requires people to remain at home and not work for that company. They can do work for a second employer, they can do voluntary work, but they can't work for the company that has furloughed them. They can do- So couldn't they do full-time work for another employer? They can. So um, these days, many people have more than one employer. So if one employer furloughs them, they'll get 80% of their gross salary from the employee who's furloughed them, but that doesn't prevent them from, from, from doing a second job. Um, voluntary work as well, so helping out the NHS, whatever else it may be, they can still do that. If they are training, uh, then they're entitled to what would be the equivalent of min at least the equivalent of minimum wage from from their employer who's furloughed them if they are furloughed. Otherwise, um, the eighty percent can go below that of minimum wage, which, uh, as Simon said before, it, you know, minimum wages. Very difficult to, to live on um, uh, given how expensive England is and um, so 80% of, of, of minimum wage would be a significant struggle for a lot of people. So can you talk us through the situation that um, a lot of so, people have found themselves in which is um, there's been a reduction in work due to the lockdown 
and uh, the employee, their employer has said, um, we'd like to furlough you. What's yeah. going to happen to them? And what happens, where's the money? Where's their money? Where's their salary? Okay. So the employer will pay their salary initially as, as normal, 80% of it. And then the employer will um, seek a reimbursement from the government. This reimbursement scheme will start in April and the employee can, can get back £2,500 as a cap plus the pension contributions for auto-enrolment and the employer's national insurance contribution. Um, the ACAS guide encourages employers to top up the furlough pay so the employee will receive 100% of pay, but it is optional. And um, my experience from, from my clients is that most um, uh, small to medium-sized businesses are not topping up um, the pay at the moment. Some larger employers are, um, but certainly um, small to medium sized companies who are perhaps worried about whether or not they will uh, survive themselves as a business uh, are not offering that, that top up at the moment. So if you're on 80% of your salary, do you have to say, OK, this is it. I'm going to stay on this until the coronavirus uh, situation um, calms down and my employer starts to um pay me normally or can you say i don't want to take this money and um i want say redundancy or i want you to give me um uh, a month salary to leave or something like that yeah so um it is it has to be with employees consent but i mentioned earlier that um, a lot of employees will have layoff clauses within their contract of employment and if there is a layoff clause, which is the £29 per day for five days, then the employer can force them to, to, to be laid off. So if the employer is saying, on the one hand, I, if you don't take furlough, I will force you to go on, on layoff and £29, then every employee is going to take furlough. But if there isn't a layoff clause, then um, certainly the employee could say, well, no, I'm not agreeing to that. You have to provide me with work and um, the employer may well then say well actually we don't have the work so it will be a redundancy um, and yeah. we're finding now is that last week there was a, a knee-jerk reaction by employers to furlough many many staff and what we're now seeing this week is employees coming back to us having furloughed staff and saying what do we do now what what plan do we put in place mm -hmm. in the next three months because a lot of employ employers are worried about um, em employees' well-being in terms of being furloughed and having um, to, to be in lockdown, and also employees becoming de-skilled. So a lot of um, uh, uh, small to medium-sized employers are now looking at rotating furlough leave. So furlough leave has to be for a period of three weeks, but the employer can then bring the employee back into work, back onto the full salary, and furlough some, some other employees. So we may see over the next month or so, um, some employees actually coming back into the business and then uh, a rotor system set up. I've not heard of this happening. Is, is this common now, do you think? Well, furloughs only existed for the last sort of two weeks. Um, so we haven't seen it yet, but we are getting questions from employers about rotating staff on furlough. And so I think towards um, the middle, end of April, that will become something that's more common. We've had a question come in um, from Alex saying, if you have an enhanced pension and not just the government nest, will a company continue to pay the same level of contribution? So um, pensions are normally a percentage of salary. So if your salary is capped at a certain amount, then your employer will pay the percentage of whatever salary you get. Now the employer um, can obviously claim back the amount from the government that is equivalent to auto enrollment, but will not be able to claim back any difference if the employer has a higher, um, a higher percentage of salary into the private pension scheme. Do you want me to give you an example? Yes, please. <laughs> So if, say, for example, the um, pension contribution is 13% of pay, then that's above the auto-enrollment uh, amount. So the employer would have to pay 13% of 
up to two and a half thousand pounds and we'll be able to claim back a proportion which is equivalent to the lower amount of auto enrollment so in short the employee will still receive the same pension contributions albeit it may be on a lower on a lower salary it sounds like a real difficult situation um and if you're a uh, contract staff are you able to uh um, are you under the same sort of uh, rules as um, salaried staff uh, or permanent staff in terms of furloughing? Uh, are you referring to zero hours contracts? And yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, an employer could just say, well, we don't have any work to offer um, and therefore we're not offering you any work and that is that. However, the principle of furlough is to, to help employees through this difficult time so the government has specifically stated that in those circumstances, an employer can pay 80% of average earnings. And that's it? Yeah, 80% of average earnings. So it would be the same as if they're a, a full-time employee or, or a permanent employee. Okay. Christopher uh, has said that I think the question of working another job whilst on furlough depends on your contract. So is it specific? Are people tied to, to organisations through their contracts? That is correct. So when I gave that example, I was giving this, the example of a situation of somebody who already had more than one employer. Mm -hmm. But um, if you only have one employer currently and your employment contract says that you um, can't work for another employer, then you'd have to seek consent from your employer in order to get a second job. Now, that um, contractual requirement has to be applied reasonably by the employer. Now, I think it'd be um, a rather draconian decision by the employer to not allow an employee to, to undertake a second role in the circumstances that we find ourselves in currently. The exceptions to that may be if the employee wishes to go and work for a competitor or wishes to um, go to work for an employer who will be able to use in some way confidential information that they hold as an employee. I see, I see. Um, Salim, um, we're getting uh, quite a, a, a clear picture from Ben as to how um, to manage when your uh, employer says, we don't have enough work for you. you we'll either support you um, uh, for the 20% and the 80% of the government, or we'll allow you to um, be on our books and uh, you'll be paid by the government so you're you're down to maybe 80 percent of your salary you're um, maybe struggling because you had um, lots of debts and um, and um, costs incurred by your work uh, uh, how do you balance the books how do you maximize what you have and what do you cut out Okay, well, in terms of maximising um, potential, uh, I've already mentioned about going on to entitled to and turn to a .co.uk uh, to check your level of benefits. That's one way of maximising your income. Another thing you can look at doing uh, potentially is to see, go on to a, a comparison website for utilities, particularly energy, gas, and electricity. How much can you save there? Well, it, it really depends on, on the, your current package. Um, and if you are on a prepayment meter or not on a prepayment meter, say the savings on energy changed significantly once we decided to leave the EU uh, back in 2016. Um, but if you're if you're paying by direct debit or a monthly uh, monthly bill that comes through to you, then your potential savings even today, depending on usage, could be could be 200 to 500 pounds per year. And gas electricity. If you're on a prepayment meter, you can still change. Uh, your savings will typically be about £60 a year to £100 a year. Um, so there are savings to be made. Um, and some clients like to use prepayment meter because it, it's good, they think it's good for budgeting. But if you're not in debt at all to your energy supplier, your savings could be significant if you went back onto a monthly payment scheme or a direct debit scheme. So it's worthwhile looking at that. Again, there's, some, we, there's some of the big costs, but what about some of the basic things that you have to that you're incurring day to day? You, your children well, are probably at home. You find yeah. need to feed them more, and yeah. you need to um, find ways to keep them 
engaged, keep them active. Um, this all costs money. Yes, it certainly does. I, 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 in, in terms of uh, food purchasing, now obviously we're in the situation where we're being asked to to uh, only go out to go shopping if we need to go shopping. But ordinarily, we'd say to clients, look at uh, either doing bulk buying with uh, somebody else who purchases very similar items, look at your two for one deals, but again, look at the price per kilogram or price price per hundred grams of items, um, go shopping together. Um, but that's a little bit more difficult in today's environment. So it's a very, very tricky one to answer uh, specifically other than uh, planning meals, cooking bulk meals, uh, plan, uh, having a meal schedule for the week, possibly, and then purchasing for that, which will help save money. OK, um, Simon, I'm sure you've worked with lots of families where um, money's tight. Um, it's probably never going to have been as tight as it is right now for a lot of people. Correct. Um, what, what can you say to them? They still want to entertain their children. They still need to eat. Um, there's uh, the, the, the local supermarket to me. I, there's a constant queue from about 9 a.m. all yeah. through the day. I mean, I just wanted to say that there is, a, to a degree, a safety net for vulnerable children and families in the city when it comes to food. So I think through some central government funding and potentially some local as well and enterprises, there is a network of food deliveries for vulnerable families in communities that can be accessed, uh, I think, by referral, uh, potentially a direct referral as well, but I guess usually through, through a professional. Uh, but also I was going to mention that <clears throat> although not all children are in school, many aren't, schools still are continuing to ensure that those children entitled to free school meals do have access to that. And up to now we've had uh, provision of hot food either collected or delivered to those same families. And I think there's government advice out today about potential e-voucher scheme to make the kind of practicalities of that easier. Uh, and to kind of allow us to comply better with kind of uh, social distancing and, tra and traveling less. Uh, I don't know whether that answers some of the question there. Yeah, yeah, some of it. But how do people access those? Um, what, is there a, a website? Should they contact them the local council? It's what the lo I think it's, it's, it's been fronted by the council, local early help hubs. I can put the referral information because it is public live through this website or this feed afterwards. I just can't remember the route uh, off the top of my head, but it is available. That's great. Um, Alec, uh, William has said, what's the best explanation you've seen <laughs> on how to explain to a, a two or three year old uh, the coronavirus? We've gone with germs. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I mean, I've been researching this this issue because it's I think it is new to us all, isn't it? Uh, so I've been doing some thinking myself, asking my own kids, having a look actually at what is currently online. And we're starting to see a lot of information available. Uh, you know, technology is the thing currently, isn't it? There's a lot being uploaded to um, uh, the Internet uh, very regularly at the moment. Uh, there's some very good advice that was put on on the 16th of March from the British Psychological Society. Mm -hmm. And there is one fantastic document um, produced for under sevens uh, by an organization called mindheart.co. And essentially that provides a workbook uh, for adult family members to communicate with children, to kind of explore together, to respond to the child's questions and queries. Um, we all know that talking to children, uh, perhaps it's slightly older than two and three, is not easy to be a straight on one-on-one -on -one conversation. It's more likely to be through play, other mediums, mm -hmm. less direct forms. But that is an excellent uh, workbook. I would recommend people having a little look at that. It's uh, available uh, to everybody. It can be uh, printed off. It's a PDF document. Uh, but just within that, <clears throat> I mean, just to give a little flavour of the kind of commentaries from it, um, well, I suppose, can I just kind of throw in a few issues about talking to children? Okay. Rather than just responding to that one question. <coughs> First, my I'll be asking point, you the same in a moment, Ron. Yeah. <clears throat> See if we agree. We don't have to. Um, I think the, my starting point is kids worry more when they're kept in the dark. So they're seeing changes in their lives. They're hearing stuff on the news. Their friends are talking. 
So I think it's um, not recommended really to, uh, to, it is supported to have a direct conversation with your child about emerging issues. Obviously to take account of the child's age and developmental level and to try and keep on top as an adult of both the, the information that's coming out on a daily basis, but also in a sense to act as a role model. So uh, I guess your child is looking to you as that's that's that safe that safe base, and will take their cues from how you are and your own demeanour and your your own emotional state. Um, so. This little document that I've referred people to on MindHeart talks about, uh, it's a pictorial guide and it's giving uh, a child some interesting questions, some parents a chance to kind of talk through some of those questions and do drawing together. Um, <clears throat> but, but the slides kind of unfold uh, along the lines of, there's a pictorial image of a coronavirus saying that I'm going to explain, explain myself so that you can understand. So it goes on to talk about when I come to visit, I might bring uh, some of the physical symptoms, difficulty breathing, cough and fever, mm -hmm. uh, but goes on to be more kind of rounded in terms of, but I don't stay long and almost everyone gets better. Because I think that is a key message here. Whilst we're all potentially gripped with worry, fear uh, about the potential, when you look at the overall numbers, um, people who uh, sadly get the virus, the vast majority do come through and are well. Obviously, some don't, and that is an issue still. Uh, but it goes on the document to talk about, yeah, I don't stay long. Almost everyone gets better. The adults will help you keep safe, and you can help too. So it gives some very practical examples of what young children can do. Nothing that we're surprised to hear about. It's the hand washing. Uh, it's the hand sanitizers, it's the keeping your distance. Um, it talks then in a, in a kind of positive rounding way about if you if you if we all do this together, I will not will not come to visit you uh, while the doctors work hard to find a vaccine. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing is it's it's okay to be unsure uh, from from a kind of an adult point of view. Does uh, that we don't, work? We don't because have all the you, you also said that you know you, you you're the role model um you're the safe base um when children ask you questions like like you know how, are we going to get through this uh, and you say you're not sure you're no longer the safe base <laughs> are you <clears throat> well i don't know whether i would advise saying i'm not sure i i would probably say the vast majority of people who who do get the virus uh the, vi the virus goes in times and, and the vast majority of people remain happy and healthy mm -hmm. um but I think the thing also to remember is that through maybe you might start with asking the child what, what questions they have and take the lead from there as a starting point. Sure. But the very fact of having the conversation leads to an element of calming. So it's not just the, 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 the language and the questions that are being answered. It's the fact that it's being approached together. Um, I would probably want to say to a child that, we'll, that as the adults will keep in touch with key people who, who know what's happening and as knowledge is developing, we'll keep talking. Um, ben, yeah. ben um, <laughs> as well as being a, a, a legal guru, uh, you're a dad. Well, how, how do you explain what's happening? Obviously, your, your child's um, very, very young, so may not understand everything that's going on but what what can you say how do you how do you approach it because even hand washing is something new for a lot of children the amount of hand washing we're doing yeah, absolutely i think it's very difficult I and mean, we've particularly struggled the last couple of days and um, my daughter um as i've walked with her around our road and she told me she felt sad which was absolutely heartbreaking and we have tried to explain to her as to why she can't see grandma and pappy and her, her friends from her um, childminders. Um, do I think she understands? No, I don't. She just says she misses them. Um, and when I tried to explain about germs, she would ask me why. And to be honest, we were, it's a bit of a loss in terms of, of to how to explain it in, in a way she, she will understand. And as soon as I heard Simon mention uh, Mindheart, got another computer here and I've been having a look at <laughs> in a different language as well. Great. Uh, we'll uh, does it look useful to you, Ben? It does. Um, do you want me to show you the... So, 
kind of a, a quite a, a colourful. I don't know whether you can see that. Quite yeah, let's see it. Um, Dossier, so it's got little, little activities to do in it, and it asks about how the child feels about the the term coronavirus. <laughs> so we will absolutely be doing that tomorrow. So thank you. Okay, Salim, uh, I know that um, you've got a, a background in psychology as well. Um, uh, how do you explain to children what, what's happening and um, why they should change their behaviour, why school or childminders or uh, nurseries are closed, uh, or, or what do you say to teenagers who are planning their GCSEs? Uh, they're probably thinking, wow, we're off the hook, but um, <laughs> it's not going to be that easy, is it? No, it isn't. Um, I, I think I think you, you, your colleagues already on the on the call have, have, have mentioned different strategies, and you've got to take into account the child's age and developmental stages as well. Um, you know, speaking to a two-year-old is different to speak to a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, ten-year-old, and onwards. So you've got to take that into account. And I've just brought up the um, the uh, the Kobe book from Mind, Mind Heart. It looks looks excellent. I think it couches things very very well. What, what's, what is interesting in terms of giving messaging, uh, in my previous work, I've worked with um, an organisation that used to coach uh, uh, multinationals on how to market and how to speak to your clients' brains before your clients even knew what the message was. In other words, marketing and selling is not known as the field of neuromarketing. And one of the key things that came out of that messaging to anybody is to speak, sp speak in very simple language um, uh, and excuse a phrase. Uh, but speak to a, a person, not, not treat them as this, but speak to them as the language of a five-year-old mm -hmm. because that hits parts of the brain that looks for information before it fi it's filtered to your thinking part of your brain. In other words, you have a, your brain is filtering out information to give you what's most relevant. Um, speak with contrast, speak with emotion, make things look very, very tangible. So, for example, I speak to my daughter the other day, she's actually 28, and I said to her, look, this virus is like, imagine you're going into the woods um, and when you're in the woods, if we go into somewhere in, in North Leeds and you go into the woods, it's beautiful woodland at the moment. But what we have now in the woods, so we have a pack of wolves. And for some people, they may get bitten by that wolf and that could cause or be attacked by that wolf and that could cause a lot of grief. For other people, they, it may be a small bite and they recover. So it's giving a lot of, a lot of contrast and tangibles to your message. Thank um, you. I think uh, that's, so, sorry, that's we're, we're pretty tight, tight on time at the moment. Yeah, sorry, yeah. Ron. That's OK. So, so, so that's the kind of messaging I would speak to people, certainly uh, in the teens and, 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 and older, um, but speak very, very clearly with contrast and emotion. OK, thanks. Ron? Well, there's not much I can add. I think there's an awful lot that um, in terms of speaking to children, I think they've touched on all the main points in terms of um, the language, taking into account the age, the stage of the child, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but also as well as parents, you know, know your child, be open and honest. And um, also we have to bear in mind that children are pretty resilient as well. So if you're having difficulties explaining something, you know, sometimes as well as, as, as parents, we take on more worry and we worry more than the kids actually worry, you yeah. see. So we've got to realise that, look, as long as, you know, children get a reasonable explanation that they can understand, they will go through this. They, they will survive through this, you see, in terms of, uh, of what's going on. So, uh, for example, with my children, I mean, you know, they don't fully understand what's going on, but I think... I, I spend every day um, sticking to the <laughs> routines that are there. And if they raise any questions, answer it in a language that they understand, you see. So sometimes as well, you know, we don't really have to, it's a big deal. But I mean, for a child, you know, especially young children, they don't understand the difference between a big deal and a small deal. Sometimes we have to go along with them. If, if they're not feeling it as a big deal, ride with it if they're feeling it as a big deal go with that as well and we just sort of like help them to transition between those feelings in a very seamless way to make them feel comfortable with whatever they are feeling with you see so yeah but i think all the advice what has been given by simon um as well um your, your other colleague's name uh Celine, you know it's his, all his name's right in front of you ron 
no, it, I haven't got it all on the screen. You see, it's I've got to go through uh, between two bits to see his name. Yeah, so it's not all it's not all on one screen. Okay. Yeah, so so yeah, so it's it's really useful advice. So yeah, just make sure that you know children are resilient. <laughs> Explain to them in the best way you can. And and as I always say to parents, you are the person who knows your child better than anybody else because you're seeing them. A lot of the time you see so yeah great great um salim the two websites that you said that and, and the phone number that you said that people should um go to can you just remind us of those okay we'll yeah. be putting uh, them on to the facebook feed as okay. well uh, www.entitled2.co.uk and turn to us.org.uk those are two uh very helpful benefit checking websites um for the uh, 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 for the, Simon also mentioned this local welfare support team. The free phone number is 0113 376 0330. And that's for the hardship fund, but also for access to food if you're short on if you're short on money for food. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Simon, you um, mentioned a, a website that um, you thought was uh, uh, quite helpful in terms of explaining the coronavirus to young children. Yeah. That is called uh, mind, mindheart.co. Okay, and we've uh, just put that up onto the web feed as well. Yeah. And, um, and Ben, uh, people with questions <laughs> about employment law, I'm sure you'd be happy with them to come to you, but the first reactions are probably uh, worry, concern. What would you actually advise them to do? I mean, first of all, I'd speak to their employer first because m most employers are fairly understanding in these circumstances. Um, although, of course, they've got a, a business and ultimately but they will uh, normally make accommodations where possible. So I think the first point of call is speak to your employer, see if you can get the matter resolved and um, with your employer. If you can't, and of course, um, you can always take advice from a lawyer or ACAS, um, which is a good organization and, they, and that's a free organization they they um help to try and resolve disputes between employer and okay. employer. all right and many thanks to everyone for being part of tonight's broadcast um salim shafi from the director of money bodies uh, ben palmer head of employment law at oakwood solicitors simon johnson one of the heads of service in leeds children's so social work service have i got that right simon yeah that's good <laughs> and uh, and Ron yeah. Peace from Leeds Dads. Um, uh, knowledge empowers, as they say, and even when you find out things about this virus which might be worrying, as uh, we understand more, uh, <laughs> less worried, I hope we'll be. I'm Errol Murray from Leeds Dads, and we'll be back soon. Thanks very much. Good night. Thank you, Errol. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thank you. All right. Hold on.